Welcome to the Mayo Clinic Ophthalmology Podcast, brought to you by Mayo Clinic. I'm your host, Dr. Andrea Tooley. And I'm Dr. Eric Bothan. We're here to bring you the latest and greatest in ophthalmology, medicine, and more. In today's episode, we are joined by Dr. Gallo de Marias, a pulmonary and critical care doctor and associate program director for the internal medicine residency here at the Mayo Clinic. Dr. Gallo chats with us about podcasting in medicine, how ophthalmology fits in the intensive care unit, and medical education. Dr. Gallo de Marias is a consultant in the Division of Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine at Mayo Clinic. She is chair of the Medical Emergency Response Subcommittee, Associate Professor of Medicine, and Associate Program Director of the Internal Medicine Residency Program. Welcome, Dr. Gallo. Thank you so much for having me. Hi, Alice. We're so excited for you to be here on the podcast. You are our first Palm Crit guest, uh, which might sound very, very far from ophthalmology, but I think that over the course of this podcast, we'll find that we have much more in common than we think we do. Um, but first, why don't you just start by telling us about yourself, how you got to Mayo Clinic, how you got where you are today, kind of who are you? Oh, I love that question. Um, I'm originally from Brazil. I went to medical school in Brazil and I did residency in Brazil. And I wanted to do more research with back then in 2008, it was not as available in Brazil as it is nowadays. And to get grants, it was very hard. So I initially came to the US to see if I could find research partners in critical care. And I found a mentor who was like, you need to come here. Um, And this was University of Miami. So I did, um, I took the steps, the USMLE steps, I validated my diploma, and in 2010, I repeated residency at University of Miami from 2010 to 2013, and then, um, Andrea, you know, you know my lovely husband, so at that time, my husband and I were there together, and my husband, Jonas, wanted to do surgery, and he didn't like it. Um, so he applied for internal medicine and matched at Mayo, so I had to follow him. We were apart for one year. So then when time came to apply for fellowship, I applied only at Mayo, University of Minnesota, programs in Chicago, which was driving distance, and programs in Wisconsin, driving distance, and I I matched at Mayo for fellowship and here I am. I never left. Uh, I came to Mayo in 2013 and never left. And I'm very happy I never left. Andrea, I must admit, I'm impressed that you had, do you said, could you call it palm crit or what was the? Yeah, palm crit. All right. See, I feel palm old crit. and not up on the terminology. So can I just ask what <laughs> interests you in palm crit? Because I, I go into NICUs and it scares me. I, 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 mean, I love being very focused and I just feel like you need to know everything about every organ system and every line possibility you can do. What drew you to be sort of the mastermind? It's like going into, a, into an audio studio and you have buttons to control <laughs> everything and you, I'm afraid to turn one. So share with us, you said you wanted to do this. Why palm crit? And a number two, Andrea, how did you know what palm crit stood for? But go ahead. Um, I love that you said that because um, I need to tell you that eyes freak me out. Eyeballs freak me out. Um, so it, I love that you said that you go to the NICU and you're like, oh, scared. <laughs> so thank you for saying that because I, I don't feel as bad. Uh, but that, that's exactly why I chose critical care because I couldn't choose. I love everything. I absolutely love, love, love being a physician. I love my job. I thrive in chaos. I I couldn't choose. I love a lot of things. So like when I was in internal medicine, I loved cardiology and I loved endocrinology and I loved GI and I loved pulmonary, but I love physiology the most. So I'm like, what do I pick? So <laughs> I couldn't pick. So I chose critical care, which is basically internal medicine on steroids. You you never stop being an internist. It's just like a little faster, a little um, more challenging than regular wards. And that for me, at least, and um, and a little chaotic, which for people like me who who thrive on on chaos, it's it's great. 
it's organized chaos. <laughs> that is so fantastic. And I mean, Alice, your story is incredible um, because you're an international medical grad. You had to repeat residency in the U.S., which is amazing. I think there's a lot of trainees. There's a lot of ophthalmologists, too, who trained, trained not in the U.S., and then have to face this daunting challenge of, do I do residency again? Or can I still practice in the US? I mean, that's huge. So it's so commendable that you did that. And then you're right, I did work with your lovely husband, Jonas, when I was an intern in medicine. Um, I got to work with your husband, who's a hematologist oncologist here at Mayo, it's fabulous. And so that's how I got to know you as well. Um, tell us, kind of, I mean, you serve in this medical education role, you are a leader for pulmonary critical care. I know you're starting a podcast as well. I, I think we have a lot of interest here where we can talk about how the how medicine kind of blends into the education space and the podcast space. What do you see what from your angle from the from the palm crit angle, in terms of podcasting medical education, because I think opto is probably very similar. I think social media can be a blessing to physicians who care about their patients and care about their the next generation, the trainees. Why? Because we have, a, in theory, free platform. Like if you go to Twitter, still free. Um, Instagram, still free. Podcasting, again, like we are very fortunate to work at Mayo that gives us this platform, but you can just record something and put it on YouTube again for free. And, and I see as three things. One, mission to education in the sense that, again, look how much we, like just between the three of us, the amount of medical knowledge we have accumulated just by seeing patients, just by the training we've had. Why not share that with the world? So that's one of the things, like mission to future generations into training. And also, again, someone in the countryside of Brazil right now can be listening to us um, on their phone, you know, because internet is everywhere. So again, we are bringing education to people and places and colleagues that probably can't come to Mayo Clinic for several reasons and we're taking it to them. The other one is like, I think it's fun. I think the connections you make on social media are just like so fun. So that's, that's the second thing. Like, I think it's fun. The amount of friends I made uh, on social media, the amount of talks I've been invited to give on national meetings, meetings in Palm Crit because of social media posts that I had. Uh, I'm the editor. I'm one of the editors for the social media section of Chess, the journal like the, the, for uh, the American College of Chess Physicians. And again, they, they hired me because they saw my posts on Twitter and they saw my posts on Instagram about pulmonary and critical care. So again, teaching, fun, connections. And, and the third thing I think it's to learn also, I feel like if you, if you put something out there, people who interact with you always teach you something. So I always, I always find it like the selfish part of it is that I always learn something. So for example, Andrea, like I follow you like crazy on Instagram and I learned so much about ophthalmology again eyes freak me out but when you post when you post your papers on on thyroid eye disease I immediately go and like download and read them you know because I'm like oh maybe I'm gonna see someone with like bulging thyroid eye disease in the ICU um so I, th I think that part is the, my selfish part for loving all of this and the podcast thing um I was telling I was telling Eric before you join, what I wanted to do is, is literally bite-sized critical care. So no more than 12, 15 minutes, um, kind of like myth busting of critical care. Cause I, cause a lot of people think it's, it's very hard or like things are set on stone and, and critical care, I believe is one of the specialties that has to be most individualized. Cause I was staring Eric, like Eric and I have never met in person, but I told him that you probably are like a little taller than me. So I can't believe that mechanical ventilation management for you and I can possibly be the same as it would be for Eric. He looks very tall. So I'm just saying, <laughs> sorry, winded. 
No, it's great. I actually really appreciate the, some of those details and discussions on what drives you into this space and certainly having fun. You have joy in so many aspects going to work. You can see it. It oozes from you. But even being able to share that through connectivity and social media is phenomenal. And, and as you're saying, the impact to think that our knowledge could be shared in a way that would reach people in rural Brazil um, is phenomenal. I've been humbled by just, we've been only doing this podcast now for part of the last year and understanding how our downloads are happening across the globe and the numbers and whether it's in Australia or in Europe or wherever it might be, it's phenomenally humbling to appreciate this platform being one that can help patients uh, you know, internationally, uh, that's a that's a a, a, a huge um, driver for what um, motivates us to continue to connect and have fun, but also make a difference in people a long ways away. I uh, I had a, no, I want to transition to get into the NICU because I it intimidates me. But Andrew, do you have any other comment on that? No, I think that's great. Alice, we, we can circle back and talk more about Twitter, but you're so fabulous on Twitter. We'll make sure that we link your, your Twitter handle in the um, show notes in yeah. the description. Do you want to just quickly say what it is so that people can follow you on social media if they want yes. to? Yes, I would love you to follow me on social media. It's Galo de Moraes MD, so G-A-L-L-O-D-E-M-O-R-A-E-S-M-D. And both my Instagram and Twitter are like that. I am again working on on a YouTube channel, but I can't promise any timeline for that. But um, on Twitter, I do mostly critical care, case based teaching, and um, and I honestly, my inspiration for my Twitter teaching are my fellows, uh, the fellows that work with me in the ICU. So every time they ask me a question, I literally write them down the questions down so I can like come back and do. A, some kind of of Twitter thread uh, Twitter later thread, on, uh, later on. And for Instagram, my like like what you said, Andrea. I personally, I personally saw retraining a huge opportunity. To be honest with you, because um, I do think my my training in Brazil was phenomenal. Is just different. The expectations are very very different. So I I personally was very thankful that I got the chance to train again. I, I'm very, I'm forever grateful for the people who took a chance on me again. Like I was already considered for US um, standards, an older grad, cause I had finished medical school three years plus had done residency um, after when I applied. So I'm, I'm very, I'm very, very thankful. But on Instagram, I tried to help people who are going through like medical education stuff in the sense that like, interviews and um, applying and matching and things like that because being an APD has taught me a lot of things about that and um, and I don't think I would have matched nowadays to be honest with you <laughs> so I tried it's to teach unbelievably to competitive yeah, the, the, yeah the match is craziness well you're fantastic on Twitter and we have a really fun ophthalmology community on Twitter and we're trying to get Eric uh, on Twitter so we'll we'll keep working on him. Um, but thanks for that. And yeah, let's segue into some ICU stuff. I know Eric is itching to talk about the ICU. Sure. Well, sure. I always feel inadequate as I talked about going in and under understanding. I go into the NICU and examine our NICU babies. Um, certainly, I've gotten my hand slapped for walking into the room and starting to examine a child without having the nurse present. So there are sort of, it's a culture, it's a community in caring for these kids. And, and adults in the in the adult intensive care units. Share with us just on your end, when, you know, what do you see as the need to, for your teams on when ophthalmology is consulted and when we're not, um, you know, what protocols or things automatically happen for eye care as part of NICU care or in part of ICU care, excuse me. Um, Share with us your your sense on how do you educate residents on here's when you need to call ophthalmology and obviously there are disease specific things but just sh so from our end under knowing when that page comes in. I first of all I want to thank you and all the ophthalmology community for choosing ophthalmology because you help again people like me who are afraid of eyeballs. I I don't know I don't understand how you guys understand all of those like tiny little things that have so much to give to people like the 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 gift of sight is some it's out of this world but in the in ic in the icu 
we we see again like you said disease specifics let's start by the disease specifics because they're the easiest one because they we need to call so if someone is fungemic we need we need your help because we need to make sure that whatever fungus is in someone's bloodstream has not reached their eyes yet so we can try to preserve the eyesight if we can combat that uh fungemia fungal infection disseminated fungal infection Obviously, if someone has endocarditis, we want to make sure that it's not end of tomitis. We don't want to wait to call you until we already have that white rim around the collar of the eye. See, I don't even remember the names. I just call you guys because we want to make sure there's no purulent secretion in the eye. We want to tackle before. So again, um, want to make sure that you guys come sooner rather than later. And in one thing that personally, it's very personal to me because I wear contacts 90% of the time. So every time someone is admitted to the ICU unconscious, I make a point of looking at their eyes, looking for contacts too, mm -hmm. just to make sure that we remove their contacts before like not like sedating them and paralyzing them if they need that for oxygenation. So that's one of the things that I always teach uh, the fellows and the residents who rotate with me. If someone comes in unconscious, make sure you look in their eyes and looking for contacts because contacts nowadays are so like easy to miss. And then the other important um, thing that we need to pay attention in patients um, who are in the in the ICU, at least the adult ones, and I'm sorry, I don't know much about the, the little ones, but we can always have um, edema of the sclera. So we need to make sure, again, if a patient is sedated and paralyzed, that the eyes are closed, that we have the, um, the eye solutions, not the tears. We want the one that is a little bit more viscous um, just to make sure, because the tears will dry if the eyes are not properly closed. We also need to be very careful with keeping the eyes closed because for family members, it's very hard when we need to put like kind of a tape if the eyes are not closing properly. It's very distressing for families. So we always try to make sure that we don't need the tape so that we take care of the eyes before that. And um, I, I'm not sure if everybody in the off the world heard about this, but proning was one of the saving graces uh, during um, the pandemic. And obviously in a, in, um, a hypoxemic respiratory failure, it does help with oxygenation. It help with, helps with lung mechanics. But again, the eyes will suffer because they will like patients will be face down for 16, 20 hours in a row. So we always need to pay attention to that too. Because again, we are doing everything we can to, save someone's life we want to make sure that they keep their their sight when when and if they get better the statistics on um exposure keratopathy the dryness on the surface of the eyes are quite striking when you yeah. look at um, um intubated or or just sedated patients as you're describing their eye they they, they don't close some people don't close mm -hmm. well enough and they get dried out or and uh, you go into the in certain settings and you do a consultation and even though the eyes look closed there's sometimes a millimeter or two there that they're actually drying out horribly and then you get corneal ulcers and a whole big mess you're treating when a when an ophthalmologist goes into an intensive care unit how much can they depend that there is a standard protocol for ointment being applied or how often do they need to be ordering it themselves Oh, I love this question. You can trust that an ICU has a protocol for eye protection. You, you can or can't? Can, can, oh, can. can. We're, we're very good about that. We have a protocol, but again, sometimes it's it's hard. Again, like the eye closed and and um, maybe you guys can teach me this, but I don't know. Like it's, it's, not, it's fast that it can happen, right? If the eye is not mm -hmm. totally closed. So we are very, we're, we're very, um, very um obsessive with with our eye protection and you protocol. think that's yeah. universal even in small community intensive cares post-surgical uh, units or is it more or is I, it uh, i would love to say i hope so um yeah. i i'm i'm confident that it is the case in big yeah, academic good. centers yeah. but um see maybe that's something like we could we could teach people if you work in a smaller icu make sure you have a protocol for eye protection Oh, I love that idea. Yeah. Um, this is so valuable. You know, it's just not often that we as ophthalmologists get to actually sit and talk with an ICU doc and hear your perspective. And just hearing the you say a couple things really 
really kind of stood out to me. One is that is that taping the eyes is distressing to families. That's so valuable to know because for us, we you know we're so focused on protecting the eyes. We say, well, tape tape the lids closed. Why you know why wouldn't you just tape the lids closed? Um, that's actually really good to know that that if we could avoid that because it it might be distressing to families. That's huge. I think that's really important to even. Th I never would have thought about that. The other thing I was thinking is uh, you have such a nice perspective of you're treating really high acuity, really sick patients, fungemic, bacteremic, endocarditis type patients. And just hearing Alice, you say, we wanna make sure that we're doing everything we can to preserve their vision um, because that would be a really dreaded complication from your end. And just the, the way that you're kind of conceptualizing, we have these super, super sick patients and we want to make sure we're not getting to that point of badness. And so you want us to screen beforehand. You know, there's been a lot of talk in the ophthalmology community about the necessity of screening um, for arthritis in fungemic patients. Is that something that's even necessary? If they have a candida bloodstream infection, our data show that it's, it's not necessary to screen unless they're symptomatic. But from your standpoint of saying, look, th there's, what, what can we do to make sure this doesn't happen? So you want us from the earliest, earliest end. And it's just nice to kind of see where we can come together on some of those issues. I don't know what I'm saying, but I, I think there's a lot of value in kind of this cross communication between specialties. So I just appreciate hearing you talk about how you conceptualize the ophthalmology stuff. What do you think um, is important for us as ophthalmologists to know when treating ICU patients? Like what can we do to make things better for you? Uh, before I answer your question, I just wanna tell you that you realized what is my favorite thing about critical care is a team sport. I love people. So I, I love the fact that I get to work with like the smartest people in the world to take care of these patients. And again, to us, and, and I, I, I'm pretty confident I can say us because like most of my critical care colleagues feel this way. We want, again, yes, we're taking care of a specific illness, but it's the whole body that we're going to return to their families and to rehab and things like that. Can you, can you imagine like, okay, we, we fixed your pneumonia, but now you're going to go to rehab and oh, by the way, you can't see. So how are you going to rehab? So like, it, it is something we really care about. And um, to answer your question, sorry. Um, main things, it's like, again, we, we know a lot about critical care, but we don't know a lot about eyes, I would say that. And uh, what we need most of the time when we call you guys is pretend we don't know what we are asking you. And don't be mad if our question is not the brightest, because sometimes we don't even know, like, like you said, in my, in my opinion, if it was my dad, and my dad has fungemia, I would like you to check his eyes like as soon as that blood culture becomes positive. But it might not be necessary from your world's data and knowledge and things like that. So so again, we're not we're not trying to give you extra work. We're really worried about those eyes. And we love very specific recommendations and we're happy to write orders that's never never a concern but like for example if you if you recommend an eye drop tell us how often tell us how to do it is like if we need to to tape the lid we will we just have a conversation with the family that that's part of the eye care that we need to give their family member you know and um how can our questions be most helpful and um, and is there something in the ICU that you like being called for that you wish we called you more often or sooner? I go into the intensive care unit for the children primarily. Um, certainly, I find it a privilege to care for these incredibly tiny infants. And I do agree that the teamwork um, and being communicative and supportive going in um, so I can't speak to the adult population, what I'd like to be called for more. I would say that one thing that is, it's less about the care I provide, but more about the communication piece. I wish I knew more when there was a family stress or issue. I find that ophthalmologists 
sometimes are criticized by through nursing or staff that we're not being a good enough communicator to family because we're not always there when the family's there. And sometimes the nurses are d disappointed about some aspect of care or the family is, and it gets to this point of ophthalmology, where are you? Or what are you doing? And I, I just, I would say if a parent, no different than my clinic, if my, if there's a patient in the clinic and mom is disappointed about the way I've administered drops, I would, my team is quick to bring me in and help me engage that clinical scenario. I don't always feel that way about the NICU or, or potentially because you guys are managing so many things that sometimes we are on the periphery. And so I would ask just to call us more when a family in particular is concerned, even the taping, you know, just understanding what you're dealing with as you're trying the best to share support with that family. If it's in the eye world and we've disappointed people, I think we need to know before it gets to a level of escalation. So for me, call us more, maybe not about why to consult, but just to make sure we are knowing that we're interfacing with you in the best way possible. Yeah, I, I totally agree, Eric. The other things I find are can be struggles from an ophthalmology standpoint, Eric, and Eric, you and I kind of talked about this, is um, dilation. Mm -hmm. It's so helpful for us if we can dilate the pupils and take a look in the retina, but sometimes that you're relying on neurocheck, you have to look at that pupillary response, and so that can be a difficult decision. When can we dilate and when not? And then the other thing is you know, we can glean a lot of information from just looking at the eye, but if we're not able to check vision, we can't communicate with the patient because they're sedated um, or they're not alert. There's only so much information we can gather. And so a lot of times we can say, this is what we see, but please call us as soon as the patient's awake. And when they're awake, we need to do a different exam. And so having that communication to say, don't forget to let us know, because it could be weeks later, you know, sometimes it's a long time later. And so um, don't forget to loop us back in when the patient is awake. And that can help us with discharge plans as well, because sometimes we'll say, you know, they're fine in the hospital, but we really should see them in clinic when they get out and when things are more stable. Maybe they need glaucoma follow-up. Maybe they need some additional testing that we can't do in the hospital. So to loop us back in when, when the patient's alert, and then also make sure to loop us back in when there's discharge planning. I think those are big things we struggle with. And then the dilation piece. And that all kind of goes back to communication. Yep. Yeah, and we and we can plan, we can plan the dilation thing. Again, communication, it's all the all the good and the bad in the world boils down to communication. Yeah. I mean, certainly sometimes you can dilate one eye one day if they're needing to monitor for pupillary checks for neurosurgical reasons and come back two days later and dilate the other day, the other eye or whatever it might be. But um, so just helping uh, the, the, those those consults be less stressful or because especially we don't want to come in there and dilate a child and then or a person adult and make yeah. it difficult for the other care to monitor what they need to monitor. So That's awesome. I love it. Oh, there was one other thing I selfishly wanted to ask you because I'm the Associate Program Director for Ophthalmology and you're APD for Internal Medicine, but the IM program is huge and it's a completely different role, I think. Um, and I think you have a really wonderful and unique perspective on medical education. So if you would, tell us what it's like being APD for Internal Medicine. Tell us what you think about medical education. Um, I, I love being an APD. I love, I, lo I love trainees. I, I absolutely love working with them in general, any, any level of trainee. I love, I love medical school too. Like part of my retirement plan is to cut down on my clinical FTE and hopefully go a little bit more medical school, but like, that's like 12 years down the road, hopefully. And um, I love being an APD. What I, what I was surprised the most though, about the APD role is I thought it was going to be a lot more of medical teaching and it's actually more becoming a coach and a mentor and buddy to the residents. Our program is very large, as you mentioned. So what we do, we have about 18 residents a year that there are the, under each APD, there are 10 of us. So we, we have 18, about 18 residents that we are, they're in our flock, which 
it's a weird name, but that's the name we use. Um, and um, what I love the most is that I, for example, for the 30 years applying for fellowship, I get to write their letters of recommendation. If they're applying for a job, I get to write their letters of recommendation for a job and like letter via reference. I love that. For the interns is that beautiful, beautiful phase that you're like, okay, I I'm a doctor now. What like, what do I do? And you get to help them there. And for the second years, it's just like when that light bulb finally goes off, they're like, oh, I got this. Like, I'm a physician. I know what I'm doing. I'm capable of taking great care of people. So I, I personally love, love that role. And it's a, it's less medical teaching and more life teaching and, and mentoring, which again, I, I love and selfishly always get a lot from it. And what do I think about medical education? I have a very, have a very personal view on medical education. I, I think it's, it's a privilege. I think the fact that you get to teach the next generation, the people who are going to take care of our parents, the people who are going to take care of our siblings, our children. Um, I, th I think it's really, really cool. So I, I, for me, it's a privilege. That's, that's the word that I associate with being an educator. And again, I started my journey wanting to be a clinician. Um, uh, I, I wanted to be a researcher and find myself very fulfilled as a clinician educator. So well said. I, it's a privilege to do what we do. And I certainly hope all of us have the joy, as you've described earlier in this podcast, in going to work every day. And if not, like, you know, this is showing how you've gone to extremes in your life of being committed to develop a career or change paths or, or change locations and where you live to find those dreams and, and enjoy that privilege to the most. So we hope that that all of us in our practices can continue to 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 serve in that model and with that spirit. I, it's a privilege to be able to visit with you today and to just you know cross paths and cross pollinate with with a field that's sometimes feels different than ophthalmology, but truly is in the same spirit of of what we're trying to do with uh, for our patients. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Gallo. This is wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. And and again, it's. Critical Care is a team sport, and I'm very, 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 very honored that I get to have amazing ophthalmologists in the team that I work at. So I appreciate you having me and appreciate you giving me the platform. I really do. Thank you so much. Thanks again. You can find all episodes of the Mayo Clinic Ophthalmology Podcast on our website. Thank you for listening, and we definitely look forward to sharing more 